Good morning, Shanghai Community Fellowship. It's great to have you here on the online service. I don't know when you may be watching this. It might not just start this. It might not be morning for you, but we are recording this and preparing to show this for the first time direct to our YouTube channel uh, on a Sunday morning. So welcome to each and every one of you. Uh, as you are welcome today, we're going to have uh, God's Word, the Scripture from Psalm 36, beginning with verse number 5, call us to worship today. Your love, Lord, reaches to the heavens, your faithfulness to the skies. Your righteousness is like the highest mountains, your justice like the great deep. You, Lord, preserve both people and animals. How priceless is your unfailing love, O God! People take refuge in the shadow of your wings. They feast on the abundance of your house. You give them drink from your river of delights. For with you is the fountain of life. In your light we see light. Amen. Father, thank you for the promise of your word. Thank you, God, that you are great and worthy of our praise. You are greatly to be praised. You are the fountain of life. And in you we delight. We delight in you, who you are. Uh, we also delight in the beautiful things and the way you have provided for each and every one of us. We thank you, Father, that there are rivers of life, a river of life, that which, uh, which provide for us. And we give you thanks for all of these good gifts, including the light which has helped us to see, to see the, your goodness and your calling out of darkness and into the light. Thank you, God, for all these beautiful gifts, and mostly because of who you are, we give you praise. We pray in Jesus' strong name. Amen. From the highest of heights to the depths of the sea Creations revealing your majesty From the colors of fall to the fragrance of spring Every creature unique in the song that it sings All exclaiming, indescribable, uncontainable You place the stars in the sky and you Know them by name. You are amazing, God. And all powerful, untamable. All struggle, we fall to our knees as we humbly proclaim. You are amazing, God. You are amazing, God. Untamable, all struggle we fall to our knees. 
Father, as we begin this new year, we take a moment just to reflect upon your goodness, your graciousness, selflessness, your provision, your guidance. We just thank you for how you watched over us for these past 12 months, these 52 weeks, these 365 days. God, through it all, you were there. Through the highs and the lows, you were there. Through the ups and downs, you were there. Thank you just for continuing to watch over us from every sunrise to sunset. Father, we ask that you forgive us for those times where we walk down our own path and rather than the path you set for us, God. Forgive us when we did not love our neighbor. Forgive us when we, for when we did not love you with our mind, soul, heart, and strength. And we thank you for your forgiveness through your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you that we are made righteous through him. We thank you for the blood that Jesus Christ shed for us. We thank you for life. We thank you for another day and another opportunity to live our lives for you, God. Continue to lead us, continue to guide us. Continue to show us how to walk in your ways. Order our steps, God. Let our lives be pleasing and acceptable unto you. Let your kingdom come to earth as it is in heaven. And let it begin with us, God. We give it all to you. We give our lives, our breath our finances, our careers, our families, God. We come into this new year saying it is all for you. No one, no thing. There's no one else, nothing else that is worth it, God. Father, we thank you in advance for what you're going to do in this new year. We thank you for the opportunity to partner with you. And yeah, we are excited it's about what you're going to do. In our lives. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, hello everybody. Oh my gosh, we are so grateful to have you here with us, whether you're joining us, you know, on Zoom or you are watching this much later on. We are here to bring you the announcements. My name is Mahalia and I'm here with our tech savvy, amazing DJ, Emma. <laughs> Emily, hello. Hey, Emily. Okay, so our first announcement is all about Alpha. So guys, another season of Alpha is upon us. It's starting in April and we are looking for you. We are looking for helpers. And if you're wondering, oh my goodness, how can I help? We need people who would be willing, you know, to open up their homes and host a group for like eight weeks. 
um, we need people who, you know, are willing to facilitate the discussions. And also, you know, we want to feed our guests. So if you're thinking, oh my gosh, I can't open my home. I don't want to facilitate a discussion. Then maybe you can help by preparing a meal. So if this is something you'd like to get involved in, please email alpha at scfenglish.com. And in case you don't know what Alpha is, it's a 10-week small group for those who are interested in exploring Christianity. And also just like, you know, if you ask, if you have questions such as, you know, who is Jesus? Does Christianity have any relevance today in the world? You know, what's what's the purpose of my life? Um, et cetera, et cetera. And please do invite a friend. But NBNB this is only open to foreign id holders only okay and we will be having an introductory lunch on april 16th where we will welcome anybody who wants to come and check it out so emza what's next awesome thank you mahalia what's next is reflect guys i i am wearing the shirt reflect Woo-hoo. represent reflect so what is reflect <laughs> Reflect is a student ministry of SCF for youth ages 11, 11, yes, 11 to 18 through high school. So this is a great opportunity to meet other fellow fellow high schoolers among um, amongst your peers to come together, have fellowship, worship together, and study the Bible together. So Reflect meets every Sunday at SCF at the SCF office from 10 a.m. through 11:40 a.m. Uh, yeah, join other students and leaders for a long for a year long journey called Pursuit. For more information, you can contact Cameron by scanning the All Reflect Parents Group QR code. You'll see it below right here. That is Reflect. What's next, Mahalia? Okay, thank you, Emza. So, guys, we are continuing with our Lent series for 2022. Three and today Pastor Dale is back and he's bringing it with a sermon called The Spring of Our Quickening. Um, so as we all know, we anticipate the celebration of the resurrection of Jesus, and um, our pastor will be speaking from Romans 8, verse 6 to 11, John 11, and Ezekiel 37. And Emily is going to be reading for us. Yes, I will. Here we go. Ezekiel 37, 3 through 6. He asked me, Son of man, can these bones live? I said, Sovereign Lord, you alone know. Then he said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, Dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh uh, come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put, uh, sorry, I will put beneath in you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. Amen. The Bible tells a story of a man named Ezekiel who had a vision. And this vision uh, Ezekiel had was from God. And in this vision, uh, Ezekiel saw a valley that was covered with the bones of people. And uh, what Ezekiel could see and uh, observe was that this was probably an ancient army uh, that uh, suffered loss in a battle and their bodies had fallen there on the battlefield in this valley and then decomposed. And all that was left in this vision was a valley of people's bones. And then in the vision, God says to Ezekiel to speak to the bones and say these words, the sovereign Lord will breathe life into you and you will live. And then even as Ezekiel uh, speaks out these words in the vision, he's still in the vision, and he speaks out these words over the valley of dry bones, he begins to see life come into the bones. The bones begin to shift and move and they align themselves with the other with the other bones that will make up a single uh, individual person by person. And then he sees in the vision as the muscles are added, tendons, organs, skin, and then breath itself is breathed into the life of these dry bones. And people have come till they've been quickened to life. And, and it was a vision that God gave to Ezekiel to be a source of encouragement to Ezekiel's own people. 
because Ezekiel's own people had, had become a defeated people. Uh, it was a vision to remind them that quickening, like, like the bones in the dry valley, or the dry bones in the valley, uh, quickening, quickening like this is not only possible, but for all of Ezekiel's people uh, was coming, was coming for sure. Now, uh, there's another event of quickening in the life of Jesus, John chapter 11. And Jesus is uh, uh, with his friends, with his disciples, and he hears the news. It reaches him that Lazarus, uh, his friend, uh, is very, very uh, ill, near death. And Lazarus has a sister, Mary, another sister, Martha. They're very, very close. They live in the small village of Bethany. And Jesus receives this news, but doesn't respond right away. Uh, eventually, Jesus will respond by, by uh, walking and moving toward uh, Lazarus's home and uh, the village of Bethany. Uh, now, he gets a little closer and he hears the news then that uh, Lazarus has died. While you were basically journeying and walking toward our home here, um, Lazarus has, has died. Um, by the time that Jesus does arrive, Lazarus has actually been uh, dead for four days. Now there's some frustration and disappointment because, because there's a sense that maybe uh, the frustration there is that Jesus has somehow messed up the timing. Uh, if he had come earlier, if he'd responded immediately, uh, Lazarus might still be alive. And there's that kind of undertone of disappointment and frustration, but Jesus is not finished. Uh, Jesus himself, at this moment, as he is in the village of Bethany, Lazarus has been dead now for 10 years, and his body been laid in a tomb-like coffin. Uh, in about a week from this moment in time, Jesus himself will be dead, and also buried in a tomb. No one really knew that, knew that just in about a week, Jesus himself would be crucified and buried in a borrowed tomb. No one except Jesus, of course. And he calls out, Lazarus, come forth. And of course, Lazarus comes out of his tomb. Both the vision of the dry bones and the story of Lazarus are about a quickening, a quickening. A quickening that is a foretaste of the resurrection which is about to come. The vision of the valley of dry bones, the, the, the raising of Lazarus from the dead out of the tomb after four days in that tomb, are a, and, and the way that the Spirit of God quickened those dry bones and the way the Spirit of God and the power of that Spirit brought Lazarus back to life is a, is a foretaste of what is going to happen in the person and in the life of Jesus and all of those who are in Christ as well. Uh, the lifeless bones and the body of Lazarus are made alive by the life-giving Spirit of God. Now, we don't, we don't today or have we ever possessed the biography of Lazarus. Uh, so, so in other words, we don't, we don't know the details of the rest of his life. It would be fascinating to know what happened to Lazarus after he was called forth from the tomb by Jesus. He would have been alive when Jesus was crucified a week later. He would have been alive when Jesus was raised from the dead three days after that. But we don't know what happened. Perhaps, you know, perhaps he married, right? I, I've thought about it. I wondered, you know, you know, how, how long did he live? Did he live a long and full life? Did he get married? Did he have a dozen kids? And did he die in his sleep uh, as an old man? <laughs> we don't really know. What we do know is that at some point in Lazarus's life, he did die. And he remained in the place where they buried him. We also know that as long as he lived, he would, would have never forgotten the day that he experienced the powerful and overwhelming presence of the Spirit of God in his life. Imagine, how could you forget the day that you were raised from the dead? Not only just by Jesus, but, but you were raised from the dead four days after your death. The, the, the Bible describes another kind of quickening as well. An, another kind of death to life quickening which has happened to millions and millions of people over the last 2,000 years and is still happening to people today. And that, that other kind of quickening is the quickening of our minds. The quickening of our minds. You can read about this in Romans chapter 8, verses 6 to 11. 
The mind governed by the flesh is death, Paul would write. But the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his Spirit who lives in you. You take a look at that first sentence again, back to number six. There, verse number six, he very emphasizes this quickening of the mind. The mind that's governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God and doesn't submit to God, but the mind that is submitted to the spirit has life by the spirit. So so what exactly is the mind? What are we talking about here? Well, your mind, my mind, your mind, and our minds, the human mind is is a way to describe our, our disposition. It's a way to describe our attitudes, our, our attitudes about ourselves, our atti- attitudes about the world, our, our attitudes about today. You know, our, our attitudes is about life in general. Uh, the mind also describes our character, the kind of character that we have, our characteristics, our character traits. All these things uh, are reflected in what we mean and what the Bible means by the word mind. The, our, when he says our minds are transformed, when he says our, when it says our minds have been impacted, quickened by the Spirit of God, our attitudes have been quickened by the Spirit of God, our character has been quickened by the Spirit of God, uh, our disposition has been uh, changed by the Spirit of God. Our minds are, are, are different, by the way, from our brain. Our, your brain, my brain, is, is, is an organ like uh, the liver or the kidney, you know. Um, uh, your small intestines, these are organs. Um, but the, and the brain is a physical organ in your body. It's different from the mind. And the mind is different from the spirit. The mind, the Bible tells us, can be renewed. Uh, your mind can be transformed. Uh, uh, your mind can be changed. You know, some religions teach that the way to have a transformed mind is by emptying your mind. You know, in order, in order to have a new mind about something or on something or to have a completely changed over, transformed mind, we need to empty it first. But Christianity is saying something very different. Christianity says that the way to experience a transformed mind is to be exposed to the presence of God. It's to be familiar with the person of the Holy Spirit, who is God, and to align ourselves with God himself by his Spirit. Uh, It may be the most important orientation question that we will have to answer. Is the orientation of my mind with the Spirit of God, or is my orientation limited to my own personal experience, the world as I know it, or, or, even, or even my family history? Uh, you, 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 can, you can see this contrast of the mind uh, before and after, or the difference between a mind, as Paul would write, influenced uh, by the flesh and a mind that's shaped by the Spirit of God in an exchange that happens between Jesus and Peter one time. In Mark chapter 8, Jesus is uh, talking uh, to, to his disciples, to his friends, about uh, what's coming up. Uh, he, he is going to be rejected. Uh, he is going to suffer. And, and, and at the hands of uh, the Jewish leaders... And now at this point, you know, they don't, they don't really see that in Jesus. They see his miracles. They see his strength. They see his authority. They see his beauty and the joy of just being in his presence. And they just can't possibly imagine how this man, the one they know, Jesus, uh, who they have come to believe is the Messiah, the Son of God, is going to suffer anything at all, at any level. And so Peter rebukes Jesus. It says, Mark 8, 33, but when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, get behind me, Satan. He said, you do not have the mind, uh, you don't have in mind the concerns of God, but merely 
human concerns. And there's that contrast. Um, you have human concerns. Your mind is filled with human concerns and not the mind of God. It's possible to have the mind of God, to be have a mind that's been transformed by the Spirit of the living God. By the way, when Jesus rebukes Peter and says, get behind me, Satan, or if that sounds uh, kind of severe to you or me, uh, it's meant, it was severe then too. It was really got his attention. Uh, when we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, we confess our sins and confess Jesus to be our Savior. And when we turn our life away from the life that we were living where Jesus was not the center of our lives, and we turn to a life uh, and a way of living where Jesus is the very center of our lives. And then we start following him. Uh, the spirit of God wakes us up. The spirit of God wakes us up. It, it's probably the best definition of what it means to be woke. <laughs> well, I've been awakened. I am, I'm woke. Uh, and I know that I'm woke because I have been awakened by the spirit of God. This is God's gift to us, to me. He woke us up. We were asleep and he woke us up by his spirit. When with our spirit made alive now in Christ, the spirit of Christ is now living inside of us and he sets about to shaping and changing to essentially quickening our minds. The spirit of Christ now lives in me and he is now setting about to quicken our minds, to quicken our minds. It's the presence of God in us quickening our minds. In the presence of God in us, the presence of Christ in us, uh, the Spirit of God is why our minds can be renewed and our true orientation be restored. It's something that, uh, something that Rock, Dr. Richard Dobbins describes uh, in, in that, that God leaves and has placed this invisible imprint in our lives. It's His presence his presence, having been made in his image, has left his invisible imprint on every human person. It's just that we don't always recognize where does this imprint come from? Where does this, why, why, do I, why, why am I searching for something uh, that I don't know what it is that I'm looking for? Uh, it's the imprint of the presence of God in our lives. Um, uh, there's a cute little story, a, a children's book that I read to my own children. It's been around since I was a child. And the title of that book is, uh, Are You My Mother? <laughs> Are You My Mother? And it's the story of a little bird that is hatched uh, in the nest while his mother is, has flown away and is off looking for food. So, so the little guy, he just is hatched from the egg and, and uh, there's no mother there, but he knows he must have one. I, I'm here. And so he begins to look for his mother. And, he, and the little children's book is about this little bird just walking and finding a dog and saying, are you my mother? And says, no, I'm not your mother. And he finds a cat. You know, are you my mother? No, I'm not your mother. And that's the storyline. That's the plot as the little bird looks for his mother, the one who has left the imprint of her presence upon him. And he's looking. Eventually, by the way, he does find his mother. Uh, I, to paraphrase something St. Augustine, uh, Augustine said, uh, our minds remain restless until they find their rest in God. Now, God knows that our minds is the space where he is going to interact with us. It's in our mind. That's the space where God is going to interact with us. So that's why he has set about to quicken our minds so that he can interact with us by the Spirit. For it's in our minds that we're going to receive his urging. We're in our minds, we're going to receive uh, uh, imagination that comes from him. In our minds, we're going to see, I, receive ideas. In short, eternal life, we're going to receive it in our minds. That's the space that God is working in. Uh, to quote the Apostle Paul, 1 Corinthians 2.16, for who has known the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him, we have the mind of Christ. Or in another place, Romans chapter 8, verses 26 to 27, in the same way, <coughs> in the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us 
through wordless groans. And he, here it is, and he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. You've got the, you've got the Spirit of God who knows the mind of God who is in that relationship role between the mind of God and our minds, and it's the interface where God meets us. A mind that has been quickened by the Spirit of God is, is, is always thinking and considering um, uh, God's agenda. A mind that's been shaped by and is, and is being transformed by the Spirit of God is a mind that's dependent on God, one that recognizes that it has been set free. A mind has been, my mind has been set free by Christ, Romans 8, 2. Or recognizing that there is a power for my mind to live in a new way, Romans 8, 3. Uh, that's a mind that has been set free. That's a mind that has been shaped by the Spirit of Christ. Chains like this, to change our minds, it takes time. For the most part, and most times, it takes time for you to change your mind. Now, yeah, there's those times where we change our minds just like that, right? Just immediately, quickly. But even, even, even in the times where it feels like we've changed our mind quickly, I think a closer look would tell us that uh, actually we've been thinking about this for a while. And, and, and uh, it's just at this moment we've decided to change our mind. It can take time and often does take time to change our mind. As, 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 uh, I want to paraphrase something David said last week in last week's message. Our mind in Christ has been quickened, past tense, uh, full stop. But our mind is also being quickened right now. Right, right now as we walk with Christ in the Spirit, our mind uh, is going to be quickened, future tense. Paul is basically saying that only those who have the Spirit of God can follow the Spirit. And even if they require a little more training and more progress, and that's pretty much most of us, if not all of us, those who lack the Spirit have only the flesh to depend on and cannot follow the Spirit of God in the flesh. And you, you, you can tell this by the conversations that we have with people. I've been, I've been, been, you know, I've just been doing what I've been doing for many decades now, and uh, and, and 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 you know, and this is not a judgment thing; it's just a reflection. You can be talking to maybe a newer Christian, and you can tell as they're talking and they express their mind on something, they express their mind on a subject or a topic. That what's coming out of their mouth sounds sounds very much like they would have said. Uh, on the same subject two weeks before they became a Christian. Like, like their mind has not fully been changed over yet. It's in a process. But have the conversation with that same person five years later who has been walking with God and experiencing daily the transformation of his or her mind, and you hear a different mind. Give it some time. Give it some progress. And you hear and will hear a different mind. Maybe, maybe in your own walk with Christ that you remember earlier, in the early days, your mind was filled with uh, what grandpa taught you. Your filled, mind was filled with a philosophy class, your first year of university. Your mind was filled with the bitterness of a betrayal in your life. And over time, the Spirit of God has been at work transforming and renewing your mind. And the things that come out of your mouth are not the same things that you spoke all those years ago as a new believer, a follower of Jesus, and certainly before your mind was changed by the Spirit of God. The presence of God changes our minds. It changes our minds. Not, not by the way, not to turn us into robots or uh, these, these automatons, you know, that we all look and act the same. We just you know, repeat things that come without any individuality. But, but the Spirit of God is renewing and changing our minds, Romans 12, 1 and 2, changing our minds so that we can have the mind that God had purposed for us on the day that we were born, basically the day that he created us. That's the mind that he has intended for you and for me. Only, only God knows the capacity of our minds. Only God knows what our mind, what your mind is capable of, and only he knows the true beauty of your mind.
Now, now there are going to be places where we are definitely going to see the difference that a changed, quickened mind will happen. There are places we're going to see this. I, mean, I want to mention just a few of them. We, 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 could, we could spend a month of Sundays, as they say, talking about in every possible way that um, you're and where you're going to see the evidence of a quickened mind. But I want to just mention a few right now. One is going to be in our ability to trust and who we trust in and what we trust in. I, uh, I, I, some, think, some people think that uh, Paul here in Romans 8 is actually uh, interpreting uh, and uh, unpacking Isaiah 26.3 where we read, you, that is God, will guard or keep or watch over us in full peace or in full wellness, the one whose thoughts are dependent on him because that person trusts in God. And so, so you see the evidence of a changed or quickened mind in our ability to trust in God. And our ability to trust in God when trust is exactly what is called for. And, you know, like, like people have observed, you know, faith is easy if you don't need it. You know, trust is easy if there's no need to trust. Put yourself or myself in a position where I must trust my Father in heaven. I must have faith and confidence in Him, for I have no other source of confidence. My abilities have completely run dry. Then we see where and who to whom we will place our trust. And we see the, 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 the enactment of this because our mind has been quickened. Because our mind has been quickened. Uh, that person has chosen to cast himself completely and all of his cares without any reservation on God himself. They do not in life have a diversified portfolio. I know in uh, investments, you want to have a diversified por portfolio. But with my life, I don't want to have a diversified portfolio. I want to put everything into my trust in God. A renewed mind, a quickened mind helps me to do this and helps me to see the wisdom in doing this. A renewed and quickened mind basically is what we're saying here is capable of faith and trust. You, know, you also see the evidence of a quickened mind in the way we relate to death and dying. The, 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 the Bible says that here in Romans, uh, the mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed or by the Spirit is life and peace. In another place, we read in the Bible that Christians do not, do not sorrow or mourn over the death of a friend or a loved one uh, as the world does. Because when we mourn and when we grieve, and we do grieve and we do mourn, we do so not as those without hope, but as someone with hope. A renewed mind, a quickened mind, is a mind that can see hope and hope beyond the grave. Another place where you're going to see the evidence of a quickened mind is the way we relate to fear or the sources of fear or, or the things that can cause us to be anxious or fearful. Paul would write in Romans 8.15, The spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you, so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you receive brought about your adoption to sonship. At the source of our confidence that, that raises us above our fears is a confidence that you and I have become a child of God. My identity as a child of God is not questioned. It, it, it's not, it, it is secure in my own understanding. And where does that understanding happen? In my quickened mind. In my quickened mind. I am convinced and I know that I am securely a child of God. That's what a renewed mind will do for us. A quickened mind helps us to see who we are in Christ and that we are secure in him and we don't have to be afraid. The evidence of a quickened mind can be seen uh, uh, in the way that we relate to the war sometimes of our inner passions. Paul would capture this very well in Romans chapter 7, verses 21 to 25. So I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, 
evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law. I mean, like inside, I'm, I, God's law is good. I, I, I believe in that. I, I, I'd like to follow that. But I see another law at work in me, Paul wrote, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin that is at work within me. What a wretched man I am, he said, just kind of calling out, like throwing up his hands. What a, oh, I'm, I'm a mess, yeah, maybe he might say. Who is going to rescue me from the body that is subject to death? From the mind, you'll say in a few verses later, chapter 8, who is going to, re- who is going to rescue me from this, this mind, unquickened mind, this mind just wrapped, shrink-wrapped in death? Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. My mind has become quickened, and these inner passions, I want to do what's right, I want to follow the Spirit of God, but I just can't. I'm trying, I fail, I try, I fail, I try, I fail again and again and again. Where is the hope in that? It's the hope of a quickened mind by the Spirit of God. You can also see it in the way that we treat each other. Now, this is really important here. I want to just stop. You see the evidence of a quickened mind in the way we treat each other. All right. The life and peace that Paul is talking about that comes from a mind that has been quickened and has been exposed to the presence of Christ isn't just about my own personal inner peace, but it's also about the way I relate to other people. So that, 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 on the planet, as a follower of Jesus, I'm a peaceful person, which means that my first response is not a response of hostility. My first thought is not of, how do I get you back? How do I get vengeance? How to make you suffer the way I have suffered? Uh, that's not my first thought. My first response is not hostility. But because my mind has been quickened, my first response is peace and to move toward reconciliation and to seek unity especially with our father in heaven and to seek unity with my brothers and sisters in christ i mean we have we have the most trouble uh often with other family members other people who are also uh experiencing christ and who have also had their minds quickened by the spirit of christ why is it that we can't get along with each other now I think we know, I'm not sure when you'll be watching this, but today um, we will be celebrating uh, the resurrection of Jesus, Easter, uh, in just a couple of weeks. We will celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. And the resurrection of Jesus is a quickening, like the Valley of Dry Bones, like the raising of Lazarus, and like what has happened to our minds after the resurrection of Jesus, those of us who are following him. But the resurrection of Jesus is more than a quickening. It's also a resurrection. So, so, so what I mean by that is that Jesus came back to life after three days, right, in the tomb. You know that story. Many of you would know that story. That's a famous Easter story, right? Then he came back. He was raised from the dead uh, on the third day. Lazarus was raised to, from the dead on the fourth day. Amazing. Lazarus later would die. We, except we don't know how he died, but later he died. He was quickened, but he wasn't resurrected. His resurrection is yet to come. Jesus was quickened and resurrection. You say, what, what are you saying, Pastor Dale? I'm saying Jesus never died after he was raised from the tomb. You don't look ahead and find where Jesus died later at age 67, you know, uh, you know, died in a tragic boating accident at age 59. You know, no, no, uh, you don't see that because Jesus never died. He was raised. His body changed. His mind was changed. His whole person was changed. Uh, we know that, that, that there's a continuity between the person, and including the body of Jesus. The same man who walked into the tomb, or was, to say, was carried into the tomb, is the same man who walked out of that tomb, but very, very different. For he had been raised, he had been quickened, he had been resurrected. A new mind, 
the promise of a new mind, and then yet to come, the promise of a new body or a new expression of what it means to be human. The message of Christ is nothing short of not only a new quickened mind today, but a new and quickened body on the day of my resurrection. A new expression of what it means to be Dale. A new expression of what it means to be Becky. A new expression of what it means to be Michael. A new expression of what it means to be Alice. A new expression of who you and I are. Quickened minds, resurrected minds, and resurrected bodies in the name of Jesus. It is a beautiful message of power and promise. Jesus Christ is risen. He is risen in day. Indeed, we're just a few days, a few weeks away from celebrating this beautiful experience, this powerful experience that happened to Jesus and changed all of us. Come and see. Wait and see. Taste and see. Father, I thank you for the promise the promise that in Christ, everything changed. That Jesus altered the world, the cosmos, and he set about to renew us person by person. As he set about to renew the entire cosmos. Father, I thank you that some of us today have met Christ and have had our minds quickened. Yes, we're still growing. Help us, Father, to continue to have our minds renewed day by day so that we think differently, so that we are open to your urging and to your ideas and to imagination and eternal life that will come from you to our minds. And then for us to live that out at home with our families, with our spouses, with our children, with our co-workers. And Father, we anticipate the day that you finish what you started, that you complete what you have begun, and these bodies will be raised from the dead to be changed forever and ever, everlasting to everlasting. Thank you for the promise that is ours today. Thank you, Father, for the invitation to come and taste and see. In Jesus' strong name we pray, amen. stripes we
Thank you, worship team. Um, so now let's prepare our hearts for um, to give. And I pray, Father, that you would bless everybody who will be giving today. I pray that you bless them with a measure that's pressed down, shaken together, and running over in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. So guys, please do scan the QR code. And yay, everybody have a blessed week. Have a great week, guys. Christmas in March. Woo! <laughs> Ah, Woohoo! <laughs> Bye. Receive the benediction. This is God's word from 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 12 and 13. May the Lord make your love increase and overflow for each other and for everyone else, just as ours does for you. May he strengthen your hearts so that you will be blameless and holy in the presence of our God and Father when our Lord Jesus comes with all of his holy ones. Amen.